<laughs> oh yeah all right that was terence blanchard and uh i wanted you to hear him because i want to do a shout out to the fabulous film harriet tubman actually it's only called harriet but uh we're going to do a shout out with some tomcat gin from bar hill reserve and this is in vermont Woohoo! And check that out, that B right there. Oh, yeah. You know me and bees. Of course, I was in uh, Whole Foods on Grand Avenue, downtown LA. And, uh, you know, I'm a sucker for bees, as you know. Bzzz. And uh, uh, here's to Blanchard, Terrence Blanchard. Woohoo! And his music. Mmm. Mmm. This stuff is incredible. Food and Wine said that this should be a whiskey. It's so much like a whiskey. It's a gin. But look at this color, right? Dark and robust, and the flavor is so phenomenal. And why? Because it's made with raw honey. Oh, yeah. And uh, when I bought that bottle, all I had to do was bring my receipt back to the uh, guy who was there, uh, you know, pushing it at the store with his little table and I got some of this fabulous raw honey they make their gin with their own raw honey oh yeah <laughs> oh, welcome to the church of Corone. I bow to you I bow to you because that's what the Japanese do and I really think that we should incorporate that in good old America <laughs> And I'll drink to that. You know, the Japanese have a lot of fabulous culture, and they're very cultured people. I have to say, flying out of L.A. and landing in Tokyo, which has many more people in it than L.A. or New York, many more tall buildings as well, and yet, damn, it's super clean. You do not see any trash, and uh, yet when you drive through L.A., you will see all kinds of trash. So here's to Japan, and they are bowing, and their culture, and their cleanliness that we Americans could learn from. Yeah, say amen to that from the Church of Corona. Yours truly. <laughs> mm. So Blanchard, he did the music for Harriet. A film, if you haven't seen Harriet, you need to go see Harriet, based on Harriet Tubman, who escaped from slavery in 1849. Yes, 1849, and she's still relevant to today. And she had chutzpah. Let me tell you something. Mm -mm -mm. Here's to Harriet. She left her husband because she was so determined to flee and thought she would get him in trouble if he came with her. He would go to jail or worse. And uh, she just knew she had to do what she had to do. She had a deep spirituality, a deep connect to God. And it wasn't based on a church or a synagogue or a mosque. <clears throat> My kind of religion. So when you think about Harriet and you think about how she uh, navigated life, it's an incredible lesson for uh, women, young women, all women today to learn from. And she went about against very powerful men and she knew she had a conviction of something to do and that she would do it. Come hell or high water, she would do it. Phenomenal story, incredible acting. The director, a female, uh, Lacey Lemons, excuse me, Casey Lemons, did an incredible job. Uh, the spirituals, phenomenal, very moving. 
And of course, Harriet would sing and the slaves would come out from hiding to follow her. So the one thing though, I have to say that was a little odd and it made the film distracting for me was the rest of the music outside of the spirituals. And I sat there and I swear, I really thought a white guy had done the music for this film. And <laughs> so when I got back home, I looked up the music and it was Terrence Blanchard, who we just heard. <laughs> and he's a jazz musician and he's not white. And uh, I was like, okay. So I'm not sure. I would love to find out what he was thinking with this music score because it sounds, I don't know. I felt like it, spirituals were very authentic to the time, but the rest of the music I felt wasn't really authentic to the time. I think, you know, even more uh, jazz in, in it. It would be fascinating to see that film done to a more earthy soundtrack, a more gritty uh, you know, wood stomping, you know, doing the washboard. I don't know. It just, just a, a more authentic sign, uh, sound of the times. But if you haven't seen Harriet, please, please see it. If you are a woman, you must, must see it. It's great for men to see as well. Young men and young women too. So get your daughters, get your sons, uh, brothers, sisters, cousins, friends, well, all you all go out and see Harriet. Uh, I don't know if it's still in some theaters. Sometimes discount theaters carry these films, but uh, it's obviously going to be out. If it's not already, uh, you can catch it on, uh, you know, a myriad of ways through our fabulous uh, technology that we have today. All right, another phenomenal female film, Little Women. And uh, let's hear it for Little Women, a little cheer out for them. And uh, again, uh, uh, Greta Gerwig is the director, female director, just did an incredible job. The acting, just like in Harriet, is amazing. And the cinematography, as in Harriet, was off the charts. I just have to give a shout out to uh, Yorick Lasau, who was a uh, French cinematographer for Little Women. And the uh, cinematography for Harriet was John Toll. And uh, both of them did incredible jobs. Now, it's interesting budgets. Uh, Little Women had a budget of $40 million, uh, compared to Harriet, which was $17 million. <laughs> What? <laughs> it's kind of a big range, 17 to 40. Anyway... Both stand tall next to each other, uh, despite the difference in budget of 17 mil to 40 mil. And, uh, interesting factoid, they both take place in the 1800s. So you have Harriet Tubman fleeing from slavery in 1849, and uh, Louisa May Alcott, who wrote Little Woman, that came out in 1868. So uh, it's good to watch Harriet and then Little Women, and you get a great... Uh, reveal of the 1800s. Obviously, Harriet is based on a real person and Little Woman is fictional, but still Joe, uh, who uh, is the main character in Little Woman, uh, also a very strong female figure who is pursuing her writing and does so against all odds uh, of the times. So that is also a very inspirational story for women too. All right. So we can't leave the guys out, and uh, the last film I just saw uh, last night was Ford and Ferrari, and let's give a shout out to that film. That is by directed by James, James excuse me, Mangold. He also did Walk the Line, which I loved, Johnny Cash's film, and uh, <clears throat> great, great film, and uh, Ford and Ferrari, if you like speed like I do, uh, it's great. It gives you a real rush, and uh, it's a fabulous, again, acting uh, storyline. Uh, of course, I'm not sure how much is Hollywood and how much is reality, but, you know, you've got these racers and, and car makers who go against uh, the suits, the big uh, money pockets, and that is very interesting, that story. Now, we cannot forget Quentin Tarantino and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Wow. Okay, so let's give a cheers out to Quentin Tarantino. Ooh. 
Mm -mm -mm. Isn't that color phenomenal? I love it. So, uh, and it's so rich and oh, it's just not like any other gin you've had. You've got to try it. And this makes a phenomenal gift. Mm -hmm. Not only does it look good and it helps support the bees, but it tastes mwah. And uh, so Quentin Tarantino, I really see this film as his love letter to Sharon Tate. That's uh, really my takeaway from it. It's an incredible film and I need to go back actually and rewatch it because there's so many stories within the story so many things he's woven together and just his unique approach. But, you know, so many times in life we want to press the rewind button, right? Mwah. Oh, I wish I could, uh, but we can't. And yet in film, Quentin Tarantino has shown us that he is pressing a rewind and how it would have been if he were in control of the scenario that occurred. And I really see it again as this beautiful love letter to Sharon Tate. And if he had been able to have been there and changed what had happened in the story. This is how it would have gone. And also, uh, if you love revenge, this is a great revenge story. <laughs> and of course, you know, Quentin, he can't get away without having some sort of blood somewhere in there. Right. So, uh, but you know, it's not that blood. Well, maybe it is, but you know, you can just cover your eyes, but it's, it's, it's kind of, it's the revenge blood, which is kind of, you know, it's always, you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, uh, last but not least, I wanted to just give a shout out to Kristen Showmaker's fabulous uh, show that she has created. And this is her catalog that I'm in, Perceive Me. The show op has opened at Cal State University, Los Angeles. And this is the page that uh, I have in it, which I think is phenomenal how they laid that out. Uh, Tony Pinto did the uh, design and the layout. And as you can see, 58 uh, phenomenal artists are in this magazine, uh, catalog, hardcover. She also has a soft cover. So please check that out. You can follow uh, the link on my Facebook page under Corone Garant Rand. And you can also follow me on Instagram under Corone G Rand. And uh, there's information about this show. The opening is this Saturday, 5 to 9, at the Ronald H. Silverman Gallery, which is in the Fine Arts Building at Cal State University, Los Angeles. And if you look on the links, there's also going to be Artist Talks, uh, three of them in February. So... I will bid you adieu and I will bow to you and I will say cheers to you as well. And uh, may this 2020 be happy and healthy. Mm.